and Nicole are major advocates of us having our feelings, Greg. It's time. Yeah. The, the men's movement that we're in here, I think a response to the women's movement, which was about, mm -hmm. I'm not putting up with that shit anymore. And then men said, oh, oh okay. <laughs> you know, and I think we probably need another couple centuries of inward reflection to overcome several thousand years of patriarchy and assholeness. Yep. You familiar with it, that it, clinical term? It really does show this mask we were told to put on. Well, the female version of that. What story were they told? You know, uh, from the 50s, 60s, you know, Marilyn Monroe, right? Uh, you know, um, you know, Farrah Fawcett. We all are reacting to our trauma. A lot of women got be nice and a lot of men got be tough. We've all reacted to our trauma and become something other than what our what we are. Hey there, and welcome to The Recovery Crew. I'm Dr. Bob Bear, the recovery and trauma guy. Uh, this is uh, this is Deep Waters Recovery, and we're focused on helping people recover, heal, and launch into lives of freedom. Today, our guest is Greg Champion. He's uh, he is he has a great story. He's an interventionist. Uh, uh, he's run a bunch of different uh, treatment programs. Uh, he's the founder of uh, Startup Recovery. He wrote the Recovery Playbook. On and on. Uh, his story is very um, uh, strong about how he transformed some darkness into a life where he's helping a lot of people. So you'll enjoy this. I'm so glad you're with us today. Uh, like, share, subscribe. Uh, uh, you're in the deep waters now. Okay, so here we are with a couple of superstars. So glad that you're here uh, today. Uh, Brittany, hi, Brittany. Hello. Brittany Bass and uh, Greg Champion is our uh, esteemed guest uh, today. Great Welcome, Greg. Name. That is an awesome last name. Well, Brittany, it's part of my story. It's tough to live up to every day. And so, uh, you know, yeah. that's part of why I ended up where I ended up, was yeah. trying to live up to that last name. You know? one, of our, so. one, of our, one of our previous guests that uh, Brittany knows is, uh, last name is Shakespeare. So you guys could connect. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to live up to. We all have our what's hard to li live up to, but yours is right yeah. in your name. Uh, yep. I also mm -hmm. know I've read your bio, man. You're doing you're kind of doing it, brother. Uh, but it, uh, let me invite Nicole, our program manager, uh, to the screen. If you're if you're there, Nicole, because uh, I'd like to uh, get started by just uh, saying a little bit about what we're up to here at Deep Waters and how folks can get a hold of us. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Yeah, Deep Waters Recovery is an advanced recovery and healing experience for men and women. We have the Deep Waters Intensive, which are three day trauma resolution and empowerment trainings. If you would like to bring sustainable trauma resolution into the curriculum of your facility, the Deep Waters Intensive or DWI and integrative uh, groups may be a good fit for your program. Dr. Bear also has a private practice and weekly men's group with limited availability. So if you would like more information about our program or this podcast, you can reach us at deepwatersrecovery.com um, or our direct number is 512-677-7847. Again, that's 512-677-7847. Um, and you can reach us directly if you just want to shoot us an email, admin at deepwatersrecovery.com. Um, don't forget to share, like, subscribe to all of our social media. We post weekly blogs from our community. Um, a blog from Greg will be coming out after this podcast posts. Um, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, our YouTube is The Recovery Crew. I think that's everything, Bob. Nice, nice. And also, we, we, are, we, we do a particular kind of transformational uh, trauma resolution that uses a lot of psychodrama and bioenergetics tools. It's a unique uh, form of facilitation, and we do a training for that. If you want to be certified in that kind of uh, work, we have a training uh, on the books for the end of April uh, here, here in Austin, Texas. So that's another thing you can find more than you probably want to know on our website. So thanks, Nicole. Uh, so I'm going to introduce this guy here who said he put on a jacket, uh, for just for this, just for this, uh, he, <laughs> and, um, uh, uh, Greg is a branding expert, a career coach, interventionist, TEDx speaker. The, the, uh, I'd like to talk to you more about that. 
Uh, actually, I want to. I meant to try to dig that out so I could see it. Um, but uh, and he's been in recovery for over twenty five years of the real deal style of recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I, anybody that knows what I mean, anybody that knows what I mean by that, knows what I mean by that. <laughs> there, there's lots of different ways to do this thing, and then there's where then there's the make it a lifestyle version, and I think that's kind of the way I would frame it with Greg. And he's a mentor. Uh, he's uh, he's developed curricula and, and workshops for a lot of treatment centers in California and elsewhere. He was named the mentor in residence at the uh, University of Southern California's uh, Lloyd uh, Lloyd Grief Center for Entrepreneurship. I think I have that right. And he taught venture management at the Marshall School of Business. He's a family guy, a wife and two daughters. That uh, we probably won't be able to shut them up about that. But uh, I do <laughs> actually. I don't want to shut you up, brother. Uh, that's the gifts of uh, recovery, yep. right? And uh, founder of Startup Recovery uh, and the author of the Recovery Playbook. Um, so, Greg, I'm so glad you're here, brother. And uh, what we'd just love to have is for you to tell your story and uh, okay. how you, what, 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 what happened, uh, what it was like, what happened, and, and what it's like now. And every once in a while, Brittany and I, Brittany and I might interrupt you. Uh, just because we'll get so excited about it. But mostly this is for you to just tell your story. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Yeah, wonderful introduction. Thank you, Dr. Bob. And, and good seeing Brittany and good seeing Nicole. Uh, I'm grateful to be on this podcast. Um, you guys do such great work. You're authentic. You're transparent. I love that you use the word transformational, Dr. Bob. Um, and I'll get into it. Um, you know, the, the, the startup recovery uh, in sort of the, the simplest term is it's, it's a luxury sober living, you know, but we don't like that word. We like transformational living um, because of what we do here uh, with our residents. Um, and so I'll get to that part of the story down the road. But you asked me to share my experience, strength and hope. And, and I certainly um, came in here um, with the fundamentals of 12 steps. Um, and uh, so you know, actually, my story starts in Texas. Um, my family of heritage, uh, lineage, uh, last name is Champion, is from Houston. And my great, my grandfather was one of the original Wildcatters. Mm. Um, and my dad played football at UT. My uncle played football at SMU. Um, and so what I do know of that is they smoked a lot. They drank a lot. They hustled a lot. Mm. Uh, that type of Texan. Um I was uh, born um, to my father, Frank, and my mother, Joanne, um, and um, my, what was tragic, and this is really the tipping off point, and I, and I talk about this as the ism, you know, um, my ism started when I was four and a half years old, my father was killed in a drunk on drunk car crash, mm. um, and that next day I felt different. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew that when I went, I knew that I went to preschool that, um, that the, uh, the other kids had dads, you know, I didn't anymore. I then sensed over time that my mom was a single mom and, um, and, and the financial question, you know, there was only one car in the garage, only one income. And I definitely felt that pressure. And, and the way that ism showed up for me was in three ways. One is that I, I was a very good student. Um, uh, I did get straight A's. And, and, and what was crazy was my mom, um, I was four and a half. She put me in the kindergarten early. So I was always the youngest kid in my class mm. all the way through high school. And I felt that. Um, uh, I got great grades. I was very good on, on the playing fields and the courts. But what showed up for me, and this is the scary part, is violence. I was a bully. And, and, and I'm not proud of that, but um, it was my way of lashing out at, at the world being unfair to me. Yeah. Um, I also, um, as my mom was, was navigating, um, and we talked about my name earlier when we were off, um, off the show about the last name champion. And really, my uh, pride and my own ego showed up in the third grade. I showed up the first day of class in the third, in the third grade. And there was three other Gregs in that class. So four of us total. And we all spelled our name W or spelled our name G-R-E-G. -E mm. And I needed to be different. So I went home that day and I said, Mom, I need to change my name to Tom. She's like, Tom? I go, how about Mark? She, no. How about Steve? She's like, no way. That was my high school boyfriend's name. Yes. So 
So she goes upstairs. I flow on. I, I throw on Monday Night Football, and our beloved Howard Cosell in the 1970s was was calling the game. And there was a tight end for the Washington Redskins, and on the lower third came up, and his name was G R E G G. And I yelled, "Mom, Mom!" She comes down, and I go, "That's what we're going to do." She goes, "What are we going to do?" I go, "We're going to add an extra G on." And so, even in the third grade, I wanted to be different.、Mm-hmm. And I remember telling that story to my first employer as he's interviewing me, and he says, "So you don't think you're different with the last name Champion?" <laughs> and I didn't, even blessed with that great name, but. I will say, when you have that last name, and、um, I feel the pressure of being a winner every day. And you brought up in my intro about the TEDx speech I did,、yeah. and it was around finding your it factor. And I might as well speak to that now because what happened was all my life I had tried to be. If you look up Webster's Dictionary, the definition of of champion is the winner, the the Almighty, the vict- victor. But if you look at the second definition, is someone who champions a cause or is a mentor. And as you told your audience, and as you guys know what I do for a living, that's what I do. That's what I've become. I have lived into my name because I do champion so many people's causes, and I certainly mentor a lot of people in different lanes. And so,、um, you know. But I'll get back to my story. I. I、um, I will say that I had some childhood trauma.、Um, there was a, a, a male neighbor who was inappropriate with me when I was eight and nine years old.、Um, I say that、um, not to make any excuses, but I say that so maybe another man raises his hand someday and says, "Hey, you know, me too." That's right.、Um, that's right. It's an and then it's a certain kind of courage、uh, mm-hmm. that that's not to blame our reco- blame our. Addiction on. Yep.、Uh, we when you know you and I work with a lot of men, and I have to make、yep. a speech. It's we don't look at our childhood trauma as a cause of our addiction, but we have to look at it. And then once、yep. we've done some work on it, to talk about it is to give freedom for other people to、uh, talk about their wound, right? Yep. One hundred percent. I I and and only recently have I begun to talk about it. I mean, I'm 25 years sober. But I would say in the last five years, I finally am out with that particular story、mm-hmm. because I've seen how that story resonates with people, with men.、Yeah. Um, when they see, a, you know, I'm six foot one, 195 pounds, and and you know, and, and they're like, "Wow, he had that happen to him," and um, and uh, so I, I just I, I've, I've set a lot of men free、uh, with that story, and that's why I want to share that here. But then I had the blessing. I had this.、Uh, my mom remarried, and、um, she married a, a guy named Walt Janicki.、Um, he was a World War II vet. He was there on D-Day, Bob.、Mm. Um, uh, he was. If you saw the movie、uh, Saving Private Ryan, he's he was on that beach, and he came home and he used the GI Bill to go to Northwestern. He got a degree in engineering.、Uh, my mom married him. I now had a stepfather, and this man was from the Greatest Generation. And he taught me how to shave my face, how to tie a tie, and how to open doors for women. Real old school ways, right? But the best thing he brought into the house was 17 years of AA sobriety.、Mm. And so、um, I was exposed to, to AA at, at nine, ten, eleven years old.、Um, but I certainly wasn't ready for it. And for me, I took my first drink, like many of us, when I was 13 years old. Um, and, and I, I say 13 because I think it's almost like a perfect storm. It's you're going through puberty, you're entering your freshman year of high school,、um, you have interest in the opposite sex, or and then also the peer pressure from all the other kids going, "Hey!" And here's the other thing: guess what becomes available? Alcohol, pot, cocaine. And so、um, I grew up、uh, in San Diego, next to Tijuana. And if you know anything about you guys are from Texas, you know how easy it is to cross over. And and for me, Brittany and Nicole and Bob was when I crossed over, I felt like an adult. You know, I was doing adult things. And as a 15 year old or a 16 year old, you're not an adult,、um, but I sure wanted to be one.、Um, and、uh, and I can remember that, that that for me it was just really you know drinking, smoking pot, doing some cocaine, and always on the weekends, never in trouble. Um, and as they always say in the meetings, Bob, it's fun, fun with problems, and then just problems. Yeah. And so、um, it was time for me to go to college. And by this time, I was no longer a 4.0 student. 
you know, uh, I certainly um, realized that uh, I wasn't going to be a college D1 athlete. Um, and so what I did is I did what I did best and I, and I, I drank and used. And so I went to probably the number one school for that is known as Arizona State University. <laughs> you're the second it, person, you're the second person in 24 hours that has identified uh, <clears throat> ASU. It, yeah. And, and I will say, and, 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 to, and to their credit now, they are a worldwide uh, global university now. Yeah. They do such a great job with entrepreneurship. Um, but back when I went was the late 80s, early 90s. And they used to make Playboy's top 10 party schools the number one every year. So, so yeah. I went where my people were, right, Bob? I went yeah, where my people exactly. were. And, um, they, still and luckily, are, they still are our people. We just, for, yeah. we just found other ways to get high together. That's right. And so, <laughs> again, I, I, like many college campuses, I, it, it was partying, but also I was protected. You know, I never got in trouble with the law. Um, I never, you know, um, I, I got okay grades, um, but I, I, I always felt like I, I was never the worst drunk and I was never the, the least, I kind of just fit in the middle. But what was crazy is on my graduation night, um, I got my first DUI. And over the next two years, uh, I got arrested seven other times. So eight, eight times total. Um, I got arrested for another DUI. I got arrested for an assault um, in a bar. Uh, I got arrested for driving um, with a suspended license as I was smoking pot. He didn't figure out I was high, but I was driving with a suspended license. And then, Bob, I went to Mardi Gras. And on my first night there, I walk up to this big Irish cop and I go, hey, I need to know the rules of this place. He goes, don't piss in my streets and don't fight in my streets. So I got arrested twice in 24 hours. For what? <laughs> Pissing in the streets and fighting in the streets. Nice. You know? Does, if, you tell, if you tell me the rules, I, I get drunk and high and I, and I say, pardon, I say F the rules. Yeah. And, um, and then uh, I, I want to tell you that one of my secrets, one of my core character defects is I love shortcuts. Love them. When I used to get in detention and they used to say, Greg, can you write 200 times? Greg, I will not talk in class. This is how I wrote it. I, 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 will, 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 na, 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 talk in class, right? And so I'm doing the exercise, but I'm not getting the message. I'm just, that's a version of a shortcut. And so when I got out of college, I had this cool job at a TV station, but it only paid $19,000 a year. And I worked from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. And so I used to get out at 3 a.m. Well, you know, not many 23-year-old kids have a social life at, at 3 a.m., right? What girl wants to go out with a guy who gets off work at 3 a.m.? Hmm. Well, as we know, we have lower companions. So I found friends and girls at 3 a.m., right? Nothing good. And they isn't suggest, there some, isn't there yeah, something that, isn't there something like nothing good happens after 3 a.m.? Or is that midnight? Well, no, it's nothing else. good happens after midnight. So I was already three hours. Three the three witching hour. hour. The witching yes. hour, that's right. Yes. And so um, a couple of gentlemen um, pulled me aside and they said, hey, you have some friends on the East Coast. Why don't we start um, shipping them uh, marijuana? And I'm like, all right, sure. And he kind of showed, I, sh I showed my bank account working for a legitimate job. And then they showed me a bank account for doing something on the side. And, and, and I, I like the side business better, less work and more money. Hmm. And so what happened was over the next 18 months, as we began sending large amounts of marijuana to the East Coast, different cities out there. Um, and you, you kind of know how this story ends, you know. Um, and, but what I want to talk about is, again, I want to shortcuts. You guys promised me the American dream that I'd have a six-figure income upon getting a college degree. Well, that wasn't happening. So I went and found another alternative because of the shortcut. I also want to say that, um, you know, I had a lot of shame around this. Here was a kid with the last name Champion, went to private college or private uh, high school, had a college degree, had very upstanding parents, and I was a drug dealer. And so the only way I could get on those planes to, to fly that pot there was to get really drunk and really high. And my use kept going up and up and up. And, that, and I became more addicted to the booze and the cocaine. And, and, and really, my story was this. And this is where the why in the road comes, is where I began hearing the voices about, Greg, you have a problem. This was, my story was I would drink, I would do cocaine, and try to find the pretty girl at the end of the night. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what happened was, as I got towards the end, was I would drink, use cocaine, and have a choice between more cocaine or go find the pretty girl. And I began choosing the, the, the more cocaine. And that's when I knew, I just knew that uh, 
that my days were numbered. So choose, choosing the dopamine and serotonin over the oxytocin. That's the, yeah. <laughs> that's the, for the dopamine. Yeah. They, and, should and, put and, that, and, they should put that as the 12th criteria in the DSM for addiction. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and no, what's crazy is all of us who are on this call is when we get newly sober and we're not, we put the drugs and alcohol down. One of the first thing that triggers us back to some addictive behavior is, is sex is the opposite sex, you know, is, is, is using people instead of drugs and alcohol. And, I, and I'm sure you've had that in plenty of your groups and, and, uh, in your, in your, um, private practice, right? Dr. Mm -hmm. Bob. Yeah. 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 And in, so, and in treatment too. I mean, oh yeah. that's an ongoing topic, isn't it, Brittany? Oh, all the time, all the time. Right. <laughs> well, and, and it, you know, and, and they, they tend to start to become obsessive about that after the drink and the drug leaves. You know, right. That's right. That's and a why, lot of that's why that's why gender specific treatment is kind of uh, you can get a lot more done. <laughs> yes. Uh, but it's, there's also opportunities for healing and mixed gender uh, uh, process uh, opportunities, okay. too. So it's a it's a good topic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big men's stag and, and women's stag meeting uh, kind of guy, at least for the first year. Um, and, you know, find your tribe, find your sponsor, find your, I call them my board of directors, uh, and, 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 and really learn who you are in that first year. So uh, wow. I'm aligned with you guys in terms of, of, of gender specific. And then eventually, like you said, a learning, there is a learning tool down the road. Yeah, because there's there's uh, at the Deep Waters Intensive, it's for men and women, because there's another kind of healing uh, that can happen uh, to you know, because a lot of our wounds are with uh, the other gender that seems like some other other species, <laughs> you know, and it, it's actually mm -hmm. just another projection of my own stuff that I'm separated myself from. Uh, but in those first months, all of that, uh, all of the uh, the distraction. Uh, mm -hmm. Is, is to, to minimize the distractions, <clears throat> main thing. Yeah. Um, so, so there I was using a lot of drugs and had a lot of shame about what I was doing. Um, and I get busted in the airport with 50 pounds of pot. 50 and pounds. I, nice. 50 pounds, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I get in front of the judge and he says, you're this nice kid. What, what happened to you? <laughs> and I utter these three words. I don't know. Yeah. Because in my disease, when I'm an animal, and that's what I am when I'm drinking and using, I'm an animal, I don't know. And, and the judge says to me, well, here's what I know, young man. If I see you in my courtroom in the next six months, I'm going to give you the five years of prison hanging over your head. And so I, I went away. And 18 days later, I'm in my little sports car. I've smoked two joints. I've drank, uh, I've drank six moose head. And I have a couple of bindles of Coke in my pocket and I'm on, on my way to the party of the year. And, and, and the party of the year is no longer my friends from high school because they've given up on me. My friends from college, they've given up on me because they don't want to be around such a scumbag. And so I go to the party of the year and within 10 minutes, there's a nice looking guy come up to me and he says, hey, do you got any Coke on you? And me being a people pleaser, you know, <laughs> sober or not sober, I'm a people pleaser. Uh, I say, come on down. And I, I take him down to my little sports car and I pull out my Duran Duran CD case. You know, don't judge me on my, on my, this was the early nineties, you know? Yeah. You are and old school stag, stag, uh, what, what do you call it? Stag meetings and uh, stag brindle, meetings. a brindle of, did you say a brindle? A bindle, of a bindle, a bindle, a bindle yeah. of cocaine. Yeah. And, yes. That's a, yeah. the old, Br old school. Br Br Brittany, Brittany and Nicole, the young ones are looking it up. Well, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> yeah, you like Duran Duran now. I like me some old music. So, so sidebar, one of the members of Duran Duran is part of our 12 step tribe. Wow. And, and, uh. and, and, and he was in a meeting one time and I go, I, I have to tell this story that I go, you had a, you had a part of me being sober. And that's how it all came about. So, nice. so I put, so I put out uh, two lines and I put it in front of him like this and in comes San Diego Police Department. And um, and right then, mm. I, I just knew, I go, I'm going to prison for five years. Mm. I'm done. And, and at that time, Bob, I had blonde, curly hair. You know, I, I, it was, it was it, I would have been a, a very pretty boy in prison, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's so, funny, but it's not, it's not really it, funny. Yeah, it's, it, right. It, and, it, and so the, the, 
the, the next morning I wake up in the fetal position on a cold floor in a cell. I'm by myself mm. and I'm in my thoughts. And, um, you know, it's like they say in the big book, it, it's, um, I, I'm finished, I'm done. Um, and uh, I kind of prop myself up and I hear a voice in the corner of the room. And the voice says to me, uh, Greg, there's a better way. Greg, there's a better way. And I sit up. And I listen, I look over, and this voice says to me, call your mother. Now, I don't want to call my mother. My mom's in her 60s at this point. Um, she's retired. Um, I, I'm going to be calling her to tell her I'm going to prison for five years. I don't want to make that call. Um, also, I'm a big, bad drug dealer. I'm not going to call my mommy to bail me out. But the voice says, call your mother. And so I call my mother, and here's what she says to me. Gregory, because all moms call you by their by their full name, right, Robert? <laughs> Especially when you're calling from jail, it's a little bit. Oh funny. yeah, right, <laughs> totally. So she gives me the Gregory. I, I need you to go to church. I'm like church. She goes, Yep, I need you to go to church. And so I, that was a Sunday uh, morning. I got bailed out, and so that night I, I went to a six o'clock mass at St. Brigantine's on Cass Street in San Diego. And uh, after the mass, the priest says, "Hey." If anybody wants to do confession, we have six priests, three over here and three over here. We have, you know, choose a door and, and go do confession. And my thought, my alcoholic thought was this, I'll do confession and I can go out tonight. <laughs> Very Catholic idea. Yeah, Very yeah. Catholic. I, 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 yeah. I, I can do confession and, and, and I can go out tonight. So I chose door number two for no reason. I just door number two and I went in there. And it's not like the, the mob movies where you have that little panel, right? And you can make up a name. Right. It's a guy sitting two feet away from you. He's got a white cloak. And this gentleman had a white hair and, and piercing blue eyes. And he had an Irish accent. And he says, son, tell me your sins. And so I sat down and I go, father, when I, um, uh, when I smoke a lot of pot, I show up on Christmas on December 27th. Hmm. When I uh, drink a lot, I go into bars and I hurt people. When I do a lot of cocaine, I date three women who have no idea I'm dating them all at the same time. And when I do all three, I fly large amounts of marijuana to the East Coast. And this priest says, stop. And I said, why? He says, well, I have a question to ask you. I said, do you have, he goes, do you have a problem with drugs and alcohol? And my quick answer was no. <laughs> and for the first time, as they teach us in the 12-step program, I paused. I paused. And I let that moment sink in. And I said, Father, it's funny. You're the second man to ever ask me that question. He goes, well, who was the first? I said, my stepfather. He says, what was your stepfather's name? I said, Walt Janicki. Priest reaches over, grabs my hand, looks me square in the eye and goes, I was Walt Janicki's first sponsor. <laughs> wow. Door number, door number two. Wow. <laughs> wow. And so I've told that story a thousand times. And every time I do, <laughs> mm -hmm. it brings that moment back because yeah. here's why. This is what I needed. This was the why on the road. Greg, you're going to listen to this guy or you're going to die. You're going to listen to this guy or you're going to die. And that, that's, that's the honest to God truth. Yeah. And so he says to me, your sins don't belong here. They belong four blocks up at the Alano Club. And there happens to be an A meeting starting at 730. And I think you should go. Hmm. And so that was November 7th, 1994. I went to that meeting. Um, I didn't identify as an alcoholic. I was just Greg. I was nervous. The, the, the plastic birthday cakes and these funny chips and you guys all wanted to hold hands. I didn't know what I was in. Right. And um, he also gave me his phone number on a piece of paper. This is before cell phones. I think I had a beeper at best, you know, mm -hmm. um, being in the business I was in. <laughs> and right. So, um, so he writes down his phone number on a piece of paper and I call him, but before I open up the piece of paper, I have to tell you, uh, it said father Bill Wilson. And so he had the same name as the founder of yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous. And so once again, I thought, okay, and you know the 12 steps, it, it, there's step two and step three, a higher power. And I certainly um, am grateful that a man of the cloth pointed me to Alcoholics Anonymous where I rediscovered what God is or what a higher power is. Yeah, and that's, and that's, so I went, that, that's, a, that's miraculous. Uh, that, uh, and you don't believe in miracles. I mean, the, what are the odds, right? I mean, the, <laughs> work them out. I, for some for some reason, I have a similar story. My, my I, I kind of the easier, softer way for me was to go get some religion 
pray about it. You know, that'll make it all better. But I happened to stumble into two pre the first two guys were priests, both of them in recovery <laughs> and just launched me in and say, Bob, I think you need to see a therapist. And here's, a, let's, let me, let's go to a meeting together tonight. It's, I mean, that's not all, that's all the clergy don't have that. No, nope, no, nope, not at all. Mm -mm. Not at all. Was this in Texas, Bob? Yeah, in uh, Houston at uh, St. John the Divine Episcopal. You're familiar? They had a huge, in the 90s, they had a huge program called Recovery Works, which I didn't know about, or I would have found a different church. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you, you would have avoided that. Um, yeah. And so, so I went and saw Father Bill that following morning and um, sat in his office and he says, uh, I, I need you to do three things. I said, what are those? He's like, I need you to do 90 meetings in 90 days. I said, good, so does the judge. Um, and, and he's like, I need you to stop using drugs and alcohol and I need you to take boxing lessons. I'm like, boxing lessons? He's like, yeah, because when you do the first two, you're gonna have so much resentment and anger, you need to put it somewhere. <laughs> I like and, this guy. And, and, right? I, and, and, and so that's the advice I give people now. I said, don't drink or use, no matter what. Um, 90 minutes and 90 days and do some form of exercise. Get that, get those natural endorphins out um, yeah. in terms of, of sweating this, this disease out. And then before I left, I, he says, you're really, you really look really scared. I said, I'm facing five years in prison, you know? And, um, and he says, he says, I just need you to do one thing. He says, um, he says, I see the fear in you, but I'll make you this promise. You told me you got arrested eight times in two years. So Greg plus drugs and alcohol equals jail. He's like, you take dr drugs and alcohol at that equation and you'll never go back to jail. And so Dr. Bob and Brittany and Nicole in 26 years of sobriety, how many times have I been to jail? Hmm. And so that's what I tell everybody I work with. I said, I don't know what your jail is. If it's a bad marriage, a bankruptcy, bad health, or actually jail, take drugs and alcohol out of it. And that jail will go away. That version of jail will go away. Um, and so basically, um, I did what we all do. I went to meetings. I went to 90 meetings in 90 days. I got a sponsor. I uh, worked the steps. Um, I certainly have had some challenges in my own recovery. I, um, I went through a divorce um, in year um, uh, six of my sobriety. You want to know why? I decided to take three years off from recovery. Hmm. I, I was sober. I was dry. And, and, and what I want to say to anybody who's listening, I did more damage dry than I ever did wet. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and you know, right, Bob, the people, oh, he's a sober guy. I'm still a jerk, an asshole, a dick, all those things, you know, yeah, because I'm not working the principles of the program. That's right. It's a lifestyle. Once I stopped the lifestyle, the, the actually, some guys, we, they really, please give them a beer. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please. Just for the, yeah. just for the benefit of mankind. Oh, totally. Totally. And so, uh, I came out of that particular um, episode, but you know, in, in recovery, I have, um, I have had a, uh, had a mom who died of Alzheimer's. I had a sister commit suicide. Um, I had a, a, a daughter. My first daughter was born with a hole in her heart. Um, and um, I'd love to tell you guys the story about that because it's, it's, again, it's the program and the good man upstairs um, um, doing it for us. So um, I, I'm blessed to have this baby being uh, in my wife's belly. And six months into it, they find a hole in the heart. And, um, and we're distraught. We, we, you know, what, what does this mean? We're scared. You know, this is our first baby. And what they say is, you know, a lot of times the baby comes out and gravity takes over and, 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 and sort of the, the natural healing takes over, over and maybe this hole will, will start to heal up. And, um, and so uh, this little bugger comes out and you, after about six months, the hole starts closing. After seven months, it's closing. After eight months, it starts closing. But this daughter of mine um, at nine months begins to walk and she blows the hole open. And so now we're a force to, to make the decision about open heart surgery. Mm. At this particular point, I'm in between jobs. I don't have health insurance. I don't have much money in the bank. Um, and I'm really scared about what doctor is going to put their hands on my daughter to be able to do this. Yeah. And so what I do is what I tell all the people I work with, put your hand in the air and share. Because when we share, we double our joy or we cut our pain in half. Mm. And so 
I went to a Saturday morning meeting, a men's stag. I put my hand in the air and I said, look, my daughter's got this going on. I have no money, no insurance, and I'm really scared uh, that, uh, what to do. And this old timer comes up to me and says, hey, can you come to my house on, on Wednesday night? I, I do a small meeting. It's about six guys. My wife cooks for us. And, and we really share on in an intimate uh, way. I show up and I'm the youngest guy by 40 years, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it's all these old timers and I know who they are and we start going around and here's John, and here's Bryce and here's Tom and it comes around to me and I tell my story about, about my daughter and the man next to me says, Greg, I play golf with Von Starnes, the number one pediatric heart surgeon, every Thursday morning. I will ask him when I play golf tomorrow if he can help you. Okay? Mm. Did not know this man. By noon the next day, I get a call. Von's going to meet you and your wife and your baby tomorrow, and he's going to talk to you about what, what's next. I go see Von Starnes. Um, I'm really scared, and I say to him, hey, I don't have much money. I tell him how much money I have. Um, he says, it's normally a hundred thousand dollar surgery. He says, what do you have? And I said, I have a uh, $31,000. He said, done. I'll do it for that. Okay. Then I say to him, um, uh, are you, is my baby girl going to be all right? He goes, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm the Michael Jordan of heart surgeons. <laughs> and that, that just, that just made me feel a lot easier. And here's the best part. He goes, I have actually have an opening on Monday morning and I think you should take it. Wow. And, and so what that allowed us to do was on Facebook, we put out a prayer network and over 9,000 people were praying for us on Saturday and Sunday as we went into the surgery. And um, what I can tell you guys, Brittany and Bob, is that uh, that little girl is the fastest runner in her class. She beats the boys. Mm -hmm. um, she thrives. She's a 4.0 student. <laughs> and, and her middle name is, is Halo. And um, that was all possible by me putting my hand in the air and trusting other men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, the, you know, I chalk it up to the ripple effect. I think that I do such good work mm -hmm. that eventually when I need something to come back at me, yeah. it does. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll just touch on, on, on how I got to start up recovery. Yeah. And um, because let me say, let me, let me say yeah, go ahead. something yeah. in response to that beautiful story and those those beautiful tears. The door, the whenever I'm I'm like uh, feeling kind of cold or not emotionally present, all I got to do is start talking about my daughter that I lost in '87 or my superstar daughter that I have now, Greg. It's the doorway for us. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it really is. Yeah. And uh, man, thank you so much for sharing, taking the time. I, I saw you hesitating. Jeez, do you think I should take the time on the podcast to tell that story? And man, I might delete everything else. That was so <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, it, it, the comment, the, the, the bigger comment I know that you're making here is that we, uh, 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 we've got to stop trying to control shit, right? We've got, yeah. because you said the ripples. I, I got a buddy that likes to tell the story about like the, the, the beach ball. <laughs> like if you're in the pool and there's a beach ball mm -hmm. and you're trying to grab it, it's good. Oh. If you just sit there and let the wind blow it to you <laughs> and kind of stay open rather than grasping like we do as addicts, trying to grab it and make it happen. And especially when, when we got some good karma, apparently Dharma and karma and all it is, is a thing. What if I, if I can just stay in my heart and trust, right? Yep. That second and third step and the 11th step, that's all about that. And I'm just not built like that. I think I've got to make it happen. And, uh, you know, it takes incidents like that, Greg, to crack me open to another kind of spiritual opportunity that there's another way to do this thing. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bob. I, and, you, I, um, and you cracked Brittany wide open down there yeah. with her, with her beautiful little beings that she has. Yeah. Well, as soon as I, as soon as I saw Brittany tear up, I knew she was a mama <laughs> too. You know, but, you know, it, p p being a parent is the greatest job ever, ever given to me by far. And, and, um, and by having daughters, it has really allowed me to heal wounds with women 
um, from my, from my knucklehead past, you know, um, also I'm a sober dad. My girls have never seen me, uh, drunk and what a gift. They have no idea what the gift is now, but when they become yeah. adults, they'll understand. Yeah. They'll understand some real clarity. And, and so, uh, you know, obviously I, I've shared upon some, some lily pads of, of my recovery and really it, it, it has all been encompassed in the company that I have called startup recovery. Um, we, um, we have uh, four cornerstones, accountability, community, education, and love for every one of our residents. The way this business came about was I was sharing at a 12-step meeting, and this little woman who kind of looked like a female Yoda comes up to me, and she goes, you would make a great group facilitator. And I'm like, what's a group facilitator? Now, guys, this is five years ago. I had no idea about the industry, the lingo. I didn't know what Kipu was. I didn't know what a clinical director was. And, um, and she says, I think you, you would make a great group facilitator at my rehab. And she says, well, what, what would be your individual, what would, what would be my individual story? And she says, well, why don't you bring your entrepreneurship, um, your, um, oh, is that to me? No. Um, why don't you bring your um, um, story um, on, um, I'm sorry. Why don't you bring your curriculum that you do at USC in terms of startups and entrepreneurship, your 20 something years of sobriety and the way you've mentored a bunch of kids to their first and second jobs. And so, um, and so I did, and I came up with what I call now the recovery playbook, which is 12 plays. One's called uh, the 10 intentions, the digital scrub, shifting addiction to passion, uh, the mask you live in, we also do a values exercise. Um, and so these 12 plays were developed in the group setting. And then I was able to take it out into um, private coaching. And then I uh, met a, a, a fine young man named Jeffrey Van, who said, I love your coaching and I love your curriculum. Let's build a business out of it. And we started, we started what we call luxury sober livings or luxury mm -hmm. transformational livings. And, um, we have two beautiful houses here in the Pacific Palisades. We have apartments that we call sober apartments where people can stay for six, nine months. And they really learn um, how to stay sober for a whole year. My goal for people when they come to, to start a recovery is let's get you to a year of sobriety. Yeah. I think such clarity is taking place when someone gets to a year of sobriety. They've done 4th of July sober. They've done a bar mitzvah sober. They've done Christmas sober. And if you can do it one year, like I always tell people who get their one year, what should I do in my second year, Greg? Exactly what you did in your first year, <laughs> you know? Um, and then, um, so we've been open for about three years here in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, our, our daily, our, the, the way it works here is everybody gets up at 8.30 and we do prayer and meditation. Then they go to IOP. Then they come back in the afternoon for a hike or a swim or um, workout or coaching with me, one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. We do a community gotta, dinner. You mean they've got to yeah. do some work there and, and look at themselves and that kind yes. of thing? With the, uh, you mean it's a trick when you put luxury at the beginning of that? You're like going to trick me into hot, thinking it's just hot tubs and massages and then I, I'm going yeah, to have to look at we, myself? All, all, <laughs> that, the, all that stuff is farther down the line. We, we okay. bring in guest coaching. Um and we, we really want people, they look, I will say to people, um, uh, I can get you sober, but the community is going to keep you sober. So yeah. we definitely have them get into their community, whatever that looks like, um, recovery wise. Um, and we also say this, look, it's one day at a time. It's one day at a time. And then you get one week and then you get one month and you get one year. You know, right. if someone had told me, hey, Greg, you got to be sober for the rest of your life on day one, I would have said, I'm out. Too much, too much pressure. Um, and so uh, I'm really proud of what we do here at Startup Recovery. I, I will say in the last year, we had a blessing of bringing on an icon in the business. Her name is Patricia Myers. She was at Promises for 20 years, mm -hmm. and now she's our third partner. And, and what a dynamic, um, just woman full of love. Um, she sits on the exec, she's the executive director of the Miriam's House, which is the only house, sober house in LA that allows uh, women in, in early recovery to keep their kids, mm. you know? Important. And, um, so like I said earlier, uh, Bob, I think what you, me, Brittany and the Cole do is we put out a ripple effect, right? And maybe when we were drinking or using that ripple effect came back to us and we got whacked, but being 
that we're sober, we're in recovery and we're, and we're trying to help others. I know that whatever I put out, I get back. And, and that's my version of God these days. When I was growing up, it was a, it was a guy in a cloud, a beard and, and lightning bolts. To me, it's whatever I put out, I get back. And, and, and I really try to, um, I have a motto, good people, no good people. Um, and I can say by just being with you guys for the last hour, the four of us are good people. Yeah. Well, we're, we're at least uh, we're trying to move from 0.001% consciousness to point oh, oh, whatever the next increment is, <laughs> right? I mean, at least we're on the path. Wait a minute. I, I want to wake up. Whether I'm awake or not is a, another question. Uh, but uh, don't, hey, Brittany, I think I want to go to his luxury uh, sober living. Uh, do I have to relapse? Do, do we have to relapse to go? It's not, well, <laughs> sounds like Dr. a good Bob, retreat. I, I will say, I will say there, there's been many of people who take a tour with us and they say, you know, these are people with 15, 20 years ago, when I relapse, this is yes, where I'm coming. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So thanks for, yeah. thanks for, uh, I think we're getting to a place where we kind of let go of this. Uh, although Greg is going to be back and, you, and we're going to have this little conversation about the, the pain and transformational, uh, 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 experience of this uh, Corona uh, time that we've uh, been living through. Uh, we're, that's going to be, in a, uh, it'll be a couple of weeks after this podcast, but um, uh, man, what a beautiful uh, tale uh, of, uh, of uh, pain and transformation. And man, it's just like, I don't know if it was that perfect, but it was like, wow, what a mess. And wow, what a transformational gift that you're giving to the world. It's like, it's uh, it, it, uh, it, it looks really good on you, brother, for sure. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Brit Brittany, did you, were you, I know it woke you up. I was watching Be Awakened by his story. Yeah. What oh, part of yeah, the story got your mo mostly your attention? Yeah, no, I really, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I have a, there were a couple of things. I mean, I, I, my son is exactly four and a half. So whenever you were talking about your ism showed up, then it just, it broke my heart for you. But at the same time, I relate so much because I was about five or six and I didn't have, I didn't have a parent die at that time, but it was just a, you know, why am I here? Like why, you know, and, and a, and a four and a half year old shouldn't be thinking that, you know? Mm, yeah. mm. And so now I know that, you know, it makes the three of us such wonderful parents because we're, we're informed, we're trauma informed and we're, you know, emotion informed. And so one thing I really appreciate about my son is that if he's mad, you know, he's mad. If he's sad, you know, he's sad. He can vocalize that. And I'm, I feel good about that because I'm sure all of us can relate at some point. We couldn't really vocalize our emotions. We just felt something. <laughs> right. True. And so we're probably as a, as a we're, we don't have it perfect, although we could write the book on slightly, uh, slightly better parenting. Let's call it maybe we'll, we'll uh, title the book slight slightly better. <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the things I, I'm just aware of with you, Greg, is you know you ever run into somebody in like two or three seconds into the conversation, you're pretty aware nothing has ever happened to that person. <laughs> that's oh, yeah. not that's not the case with you, brother. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. So thank you for being a person of depth. And, uh, you know, one thing is we probably aren't going to pass along as, uh, you know, we pass along some of the stuff that our folks had. My dad was a World War II veteran too, tough guy, beautiful <clears throat> human being, but just, yeah. it just wasn't in his body to be emotionally open. And that got passed to me. It's not, we're not blaming our parents with this trauma work. <laughs> They're doing the best they could, just like we are, you know? And uh, uh, so you know, that's the work, just being around other people doing the work, you know, and that's, uh, that, that's, that's how I get inspired to keep growing. So that, you know, it looks like maybe I'm doing this podcast to teach the world a bunch. No, I'm doing this podcast. So I get to meet guys like Greg, um, and Brittany. So thank you both for being here today. Uh, this, this was a fun one. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Greg, why don't you uh, go ahead and let folks know how they can uh, reach you because they're going to mm -hmm. want to, I guarantee cool. you. Cool. Cool. So uh, the best way to reach me is um, I'm going to give you a couple websites. Uh, first is startuprecovery.com, and that's regarding our transitional living here in Los Angeles. We also have startupapartments.com, which is the 
um, sober apartments. So I call it independent living with guardrails. <laughs> and then if you guys want to follow me on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, it's always at Greg two G's at the end champion. Um, and I certainly, and I'm happy to give my email out as well too. So it's G R E G G at startup recovery.com. Um, and, uh, I'm, I, I answer emails and text and, uh, and I know that in order for me to keep it, I got to give it away. So, and I just want to say, uh, Dr. Bob and Brittany, thank you so much for this dynamic hour. I, I feel uh, very close to both of you um, in our recovery and being good parents and also being uh, ambassadors to recovery. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I, I just want to, I feel a whole lot of gratitude today that we're able to, to, to get this podcast out. Yeah, thank what you. A- what a good connection. Thanks for taking the time. Now, Brittany uh, is the uh, business development specialist out at the Last Resort Treatment Center, which I'll just give a pitch for. You know, that's where I know the kind of work that's going on out there. It is the real deal, Greg. I don't know how much familiarity you have with uh, Central Texas treatment, but uh, uh, the Last Resort uh, Treatment Center is a go-to. And uh, Brittany is one of the the folks that keeps that thing rolling. So why don't you let folks know how they can reach you, Brittany? Yeah, absolutely. So I can be reached via phone at 512-948-6403 or via email, Brittany, B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y, Bass, B-A-S-S, at lastresortrecovery.com. Yeah. And uh, you can find both of these folks. Greg's not on there yet, but on our About Us page, all of our, you guys are... Greg, you're now part of the recovery crew, whether you want it to be or not. <laughs> so Good. You know, you, Brittany Love is on, on our website as well. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks for being here, both of you. Nicole, are you still with us? You must, uh, uh, that that story probably kept you awake. Yep, there she is. Sure did. Um, if you would <laughs> let folks know how to reach us, uh, Deep Waters Recovery. Yeah. Thanks, Bob and Brittany. And thank you, Greg, for sharing your story. I loved it. I really appreciate you being here. Um, If you'd like more information about our programs or this podcast, um, like Bob said, you can reach us at deepwatersrecovery.com. Our direct number is 512-677-7847. Please like, share, subscribe, and follow us in order to support this mission of recovery, healing, and launching into lives of authenticity. Uh, Dr. Bear is the recovery and trauma guy, and he sees a limited amount of individual clients, and he has ongoing group programming. Uh, The three-day deep waters intensive for professionals is scheduled for the spring 2021. If you would like to um, sign up for that, you can visit our website. Um, And if you would like to bring sustainable trauma resolution into the curriculum of your facility, the deep waters intensive and integration groups may be a good fit. Um, And just one more time, 512-677-7847. Yeah. And Nicole is, I'm just going to say it out loud. Nicole is moving on to other things. We're going to miss you. I'm not going to cry about it yet. I don't say goodbye to people until they're just about out the door, but you have added so much. We've been doing, she's on to really great superstar things. Uh, and I'm just going to, I want to do it in public. Thank you so much for all your good work. Yay. Um, <laughs> Thanks, thank Bob. You. And, uh, we're going to still stay connected, but you won't be in this role. Uh, I, I would just add that we're doing facilitator trainings for folks that want to learn this dynamic version of the experiential facilitation. Uh, that will be at the end of April. And also, you know, you reminded me, I wrote a book, Greg, and I keep forgetting to tell people about it, but that's on our website too. It's called The Creative Fire, uh, 10 Weeks to Emotional and Creative Fitness. So uh, if you're looking to launch into your, your creative bliss, it's a pretty good guide. So thank you everybody for being well, here. Dr. Bob, one, uh, yeah, one second. Go for it. I forgot, speaking go for of books, it. I forgot the recovery playbook. That's we right. Have, we have a, a book. It's online. It's called the recoveryplaybook.com. And the best link, and I, and I have discount codes for your listeners. If they go to the recoveryplaybook.com backslash get started. And, um, and uh, again, it's, it's, it's the same teachings I do one-on-one here. But the people get all the videos as an online subscription. So um, uh, you you hit the keyword book, and I know I needed to pitch that, or my yep. partners would be uh, upset with me. But thank you, thank you again. Yep, we got to talk about the stuff where people won't know. I mean, we put yep. we spent you and I spent quite a bit of time 
uh, sitting with mentors and other people that we've just gathered the wisdom. There gets to be a point when you have to like get it out to others. <laughs> so, and be willing to let people know about it. So let's continue yeah. to support all of us in bringing our gifts to the world. And I think we've all done a pretty good job of that today. Just a reminder, Greg will be back either next week or a couple of weeks from now uh, with this uh, really juicy topic around um, the the uh, opportunity for growth that Corona has uh, br uh, brought us. Even though there's uh, plenty of tragedy in, in the same region, there's also been a lot of gifts. So we're going to have that conversation. So thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, we are in the deep waters now.